I'm excited about the word of the Lord this morning, so we're getting ready to go into the word. But before I do, uh, my son and daughter are here and his wife, uh, Gerald and Ashley. Well, Felix and Ashley. I like saying that Felix thing, you know, because it just feels good. I want them to come for those that haven't met them as of yet, um, just to get a chance to connect with these two individuals. Yeah. I'm a proud daddy. Amen. Is that all right? I'm excited about what God is always. It's always exciting for a dad when your kids are serving the Lord and um, just doing what God would have them to do. Amen. That's what it's all about, that they're not doing crazy stuff. But these two individuals love God. Um, for those that don't know, they met here in youth ministry. Um, I hope you all was paying attention to the lessons. No. Nope. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> and then they fell in love here and got married here and all that good stuff. And then the Lord... Uh, relocated them to the Maryland area. So y'all come on up. I just want y'all to take a moment um, and uh, tell us what's going on, what's happening in your life, what God is doing, what's happening up in the Maryland area. Yeah. Good morning, RCF. How you all doing, first of all? Oh, oh y'all live for 8 o'clock. All right. <laughs> no, 9 o'clock. But from, from greetings from Maryland, definitely obviously want to make sure that we give honor to, to Pops. Uh, for this opportunity. I'm Pastor um, Gilbert to you. Pastor Gilbert. Thank Dr. You. Gilbert. Dr. Okay. Gilbert. Okay, Dr. Reverend Dr. Bishop. No, <laughs> no but we just want to send our love. My wife, Ashley, and I, um, this is our home. This is our home base. This is where we, we grew up. Um, and from all the way from Maryland, we just want to send our love. I know you all have seen our kids running up and down these aisles, you know. So, unfortunately, we got to take them back. I want to leave him with, them here with y'all. <laughs> But just to kind of share a little bit about what we're doing um, back home in Maryland. Um, so we started uh, a, a organization by the name of Ground Zero. Um, for those of you that know some of our back, back history, that actually used to be the youth ministry here was Ground Zero. You know, and we left, you know, and we're like, okay, we're going back. Left Ground Zero behind. And, you know, we actually went through some hell. We went through a lot of stuff. Um, specifically dealing with my own stuff, with my sexual addiction that I brought into the marriage. I thought, okay, hey, I had this thing before I got married thinking, okay, this thing is just going to disappear. And I was like, you put gasoline on the fire and it blew up when I got married. So now through our recovery journey, through intense counseling, through a lot of one-on-one -on -one individual work, uh, God started to show Ashley and I our real calling and who we really are, right? I started to find my identity in walking through the pain, walking through that journey, which is where Ground Zero came to be. And I'll let you kind of share a little yeah, on that. We went through a lot, and a lot of people didn't know what we were going through. And I so didn't. Our <laughs> passion yeah. really now is to let people know, number one, they're not alone dealing with stuff. And so since Pastor is talking about identity, we can't do it alone, find that alone. You know, we need community, we need accountability. And so for us, that came in groups and therapy and coaching. And so that's what we do through Ground Zeroes. We are now, you know, certified life coaches and we walk through people through recovery coaching. Um, and, you know, we, we specialize in addiction, but we, our passion really is to help people find freedom emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And that takes work to get to the core of who you are. And that's really our passion is to dig deep, to do the work. And, you know, the work means a lot, but it, it really means digging in and gathering other people, digging into the word to find out who we truly are. But it took some pain for us to get to this place. It wasn't like we just skipped along and found it. it really, It was a painful place that we found who God really created us at our core. And so, you know, our passion is to help people recover, be recovered, to be restored, and to be repurposed. And not recovery if you have an addiction, but recovery because we all have something that we, we cover up drama. with. <laughs> and God is, you know, desires to recover us yeah. and walk us to be um, repurposed and walk in who he really called us to be. So what would you say, what would you say to our congregation as it relates to them finding their identity? We're talking about identity. What would you say to them briefly and then we're going to the world? Yeah, I would definitely say echo what Ashley shared, right? Because so many of us have our own stories, right? Everybody has a past. Everybody has pain. But oftentimes, especially in Christendom, and that's, what, that's one thing that, that honestly, I'm going to just be straight up, that pisses me off about the faith, the Christian title, right? Is because oftentimes when it says, man, I'm hurt. This dude, this dude hurt me. We often talk, oh, well, God will bless it, baby. Just pray and it'll go away. No, sometimes you need a little bit more than prayer, right? 
And oftentimes we just kind of throw this blanket just thinking that God is just going to cover over and take this pain away. But oftentimes you have to be willing to address that pain to fight it. Because think about it like this. Jesus died on a cross, right? He went through some serious pain, right? So why do we think that we don't have to deal with any sort of pain in order to get a bigger glory, to, get a, 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 to heal, to be restored, right? you got to go through some things, and you can't just run. And I, I know that dealing with past hurts and pains is difficult because I've had to deal with them myself. Right? My wife has had to deal with them. So I would definitely say stand up, address your pains, and put people around you right? that, that know you're so you ain't got to tell it to everybody. Right? <laughs> but put people around you that, that you trust that can help hold you accountable during your toughest times so that you can really come out at the end and really know who you are. I'll, I'll just be straight. I'll take a few extra seconds. But I'll just be straight. Like, for example, I know my past. I know what's in me. So I know I have to be cautious about what I do when I go out. And all that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming on worship. And come on, I appreciate these two. Amen. Uh, like I said, I'm one um, proud daddy. I'm excited about my kids. I'm excited about, um, and I'm more than happy to see them because they get to take their children back. <laughs> hallelujah. Yeah. That's that's the exciting thing. So, yeah. That's amen. Hallelujah. I'll even buy the plane ticket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But don't get me wrong, I love my kids. Um, as you can tell, being a Gilbert, transparency are us. You know, we believe in being open because it really helps keep the air clear so that God could have, um, be who God would have. Most of you might remember um, Ashley's parents, in case you do, that was um, Julian and Candy. They were part of our leadership here as well, too. So we're just excited to see what God is doing. Amen? Hey, grab your Bibles. Um, let's get ready to go to work. Um, we're going to jump into the Word of God this morning. I am going to pick up with the issue of identity, I'm going to review just briefly, and then I'm going to share some, um, I don't know what the word to use to describe what I'm going to share with you this morning because uh, I'm still working through it. Um, <laughs> sometimes I tap in a couple of our elders when I'm studying and challenge them a little bit to kind of think with me, and I only had like two responds, so, <laughs> so that means they're like, you on your own, pastor, you know. <laughs> So um, pray, pray, pray with me as we kind of talk through this. Um, I don't, I dare not say I'm going to tread new ground. Uh, I want to illumine your eyes to some things uh, in Scripture as we talk about identity to help us define more clearly who we are. So um, give ear, listen, take some notes, um, capture what you're going to see on the screen, and as usual on Wednesday we're going to dig deeper. Is that all right, y'all? Come on, is that all right? Say amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for you. We give our hearts to you. Open our hearts as we just share briefly, Lord, um, what you would have us to share. So I pray for Felix that he would empty himself. Um, remove me. I have nothing to say, God, because you're, you're revolutionizing my life. Um, I love the song that the worship team uh, opened up with, God. I know who I am. It's, it, you created us as a new identity. So, But we have to walk in that. So um, forgive us for all our failings, all our frailties. Um, Satan, we serve you notice because at least in this church, people are starting to define themselves through Christ. So give me, God, fresh revelation. Bring to memory and have me say only what you would have me to say. So we bless you, we worship you, and we adore you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. So um, come on, say made in the image of God. Say it again. Y'all say it like you mean it. Come on, say made in the image of God. Point to yourself. Say self. I am made in the image of God. I need a little more energy. Come on, say self. I am made in the image of God. Amen. Good, good, good. So here's what we've been saying about this um, new definition I want to give you this morning. This is interesting. Um, been doing some more research and some more study. As an image bearer, God's design for me, um, and, you know, sermons change every second of the way. So this morning in my review time at Starbucks, um, this statement came to me. Um, God's design for me is that I become like him and I represent him in the earth. You guys all right with that? Process that for a little while. God's design is that I become like him and then I represent him in the earth. Let me tell you what that means real quick. As it relates to I'm made in the image of God, is that when people see me, I ought to be a reflection of who God is. You kind of get what I'm saying? So listen to this because this is where we're going to hang out for a little bit today. My behaviors ought to be God-like. 
Come on, y'all. All right? My behaviors ought to be God-like. So we'll be talking about that a little bit um, to kind of get to where God would have us to go. So we talked about sin last week. And more specifically, we tried, we said several things about sin. But here's all I want you to hear about sin this morning. It is a lack of conformity, be it active or passive. And Wednesday night, we had some very, very interesting discussions because a lot of us hear sin and we think something external to us. Uh, but now we're talking about something that can be active or passive to the moral law of God. This may be a matter of act, thought, or of inner disposition of state. So sin is a failure to live up to what God expects of us in act, thought, and being. Okay? So repeat after me. Say, my mind must reflect the mind of Christ. Spent a lot of time fleshing that out on last week as it relates to how I think, how I function, and how I do. So lock into this. So um, you want to know what the source of sin, all we spent some time and we had enough time to do last Wednesday, is that sin, the source of sin, is not so much external, even though it is, but what we spent time talking about last week is that a lot of times we are our own worst enemy. I want you to hear me say that, all right? I don't want you to hear me say or make the mistake of continually saying, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Yes, the devil tempts. Yes, all that stuff. But a lot of time, like it says in James uh, chapter 4, we are tempted when we are drawn away by our own lust, our own passions, our own desires. So here's what we said. It is caused by our own internal struggles. It's self-inflicted when we distort Things that God give us that are naturally good for us, okay? So we have natural desires to enjoy things. We have natural desires to want to obtain things. We have natural desires to want to do things. And God gave us those natural desires so we can be like him and we can represent him in the earth. Where sin comes in is when we take the natural desires and distort it for our own good. Does that make sense? Okay, and we gave you several illustrations, and I'm going to go through that because I want to spend some time talking about what I want to share this morning. So, um, so here's where I want to begin and kind of talk through as we kind of talk through this. So listen to this statement really, really carefully because this is where it might start to shift some of your thinking, or I want to invite you to go home and do your own work. I say this all the time um, when I speak. Don't take what Pastor Felix says as the law. I want you to do your own digging, and we come together on Wednesday night and work through what we find out. So listen to this. What you see of me, I'm kind of shifting a little bit, is not only my flesh at work, but my soul or spirit, and I'm, you're going to hear me say this a lot today. You're going to hear me say soul or spirit. You're not going to hear me say soul and spirit, okay? And I'll explain and I will talk through that because this is what's going to be challenging for a lot of us. What you see of me is my flesh at work, um, or but my soul, not only my flesh, but my soul or spirit working together as a unified being producing the behaviors you experience. So I love what um, Gerald and Nancy just got through saying. Here's what Gerald said. I had my own stuff going on. And here's what that statement says. What he was experiencing and what Ashley was experiencing, even Katani and I, what we experienced in our marriage and the things, the behaviors you see of us, I dare not say to you it was my flesh acting out. I want you to hear me say for the first time, and we're going to walk through this in Scripture, it was all of me. It was who I am. I want to work there, okay? We're talking about identity, right? If we don't own up to who we are, the enemy will continually deceive us into believing that we are what we are not. Ownership is number one. So what you see of me was the totality of who I was working and being all who God would have us to be. So I'm going to go through some scriptures. Um, I'm just going to lay some foundation because next week I'll flesh it out a little more. So I want to whet the appetite because today could potentially be overwhelming, especially if you're hearing some stuff for the first time. Okay. So here's where I want to begin. Before I even read that, here's what we, most of us said. That if I say to you, what is the human make, person made up of, here's what the majority of us have said over time. 
is that we are a trichotism or a three-part individual. Here's what we would say. Body, soul, and spirit. Are you with me? And we will even go as far as to say in our explanation, well, God is a trinity, and he made us a trinity. And if he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we will spend a lot of time rationalizing that I, too, am body, soul, and spirit, okay? Now, the reason I want to take a moment to explain this before I even go on is that if we, and I don't want to offend nobody, so y'all just walk through this with me. If we erroneously say that, here's what we're going to do. We'll be able to separate the soul from the body and separate the soul and body from the spirit. And then here's what we're going to say. Our spirit is this unique thing, and we discount the flesh, then we blame everything on the flesh, okay? I hope you haven't been missing what I've been teaching all along. Your flesh is important to God. Y'all say amen so I can know y'all here. Amen. We don't want people online think he's preaching to an empty church. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, one more time, say amen. We'll walk it out. We'll walk it out. So I want to begin here, Okay. Here's a shift that's going to be new information for a lot of us. All humans, all humans, all humans, I want to lay this argument, consists of two parts, not three. And we'll talk about why this is important so we can walk it out as it relates to defining our identity, okay? Because a lot of us will hide behind the third person if we don't get this concept well, right? And so here's what we'll say mistakenly. At least God sees my heart. It's holy. So don't look at my flesh. Look at my heart. You guys are tracking with me? We need a camera up here to kind of point that way to kind of share the look on some of the faces because y'all are like, Peter, you're messing us up. Genesis chapter 2. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And then, uh, well, chapter 1, let me give you a couple of scriptures. Genesis chapter 1. And um, this is probably going to be some of the only scriptures we'll have time to look at today. And I'll just share some things, and then we're going to flesh it out because this identity piece is oh so critical. Genesis chapter 1, uh, jump down to verse 26. Genesis 1 and 26, and keep your Bibles open as we walk through this because from here on out, I'm just going to share um, about some things, and then we're going to talk through this. Okay. Amen. You guys are there? Look at what 26 says. Then God said, let us make man how? Come on, y'all talk to me. How? And after what? Okay, good. And he says, and let them, being humankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping things that creeps on the earth. And verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, my translation says that God created them. And I'm in the ESV. And then notice what it says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over every living thing that moves on the ground. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in it, you shall have, um, have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every birth of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. Now look at the next phrase. And it was so. Say verse 31. Come on, say verse 31. Watch this. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So listen to this, and I'm going to read Genesis chapter 2. When God created man based on 1, 26 to 31, here is the conclusion, just like he said, at the end of everything he created, that is very good. So when God got done with me, he was like, that's what I'm talking about. Come on, y'all. You ever made something that you just sat back and said, 
And he probably went to the Holy Hey, G, give, what you think? What you think? Give me some. Put it up here. Yeah, he was like so proud of his creation because it was good. And he says, that's what I'm talking about. So listen to this. In its original state, what God created is good. Pre-sin. Amen. You guys are tracking with me. Come on, it was very good. Come on, say it again. Say it was very good. Let's move. Job to chapter 2. Let me show you what God was saying was very good. And chapter 2 now goes into a little bit of detail of what God, God's creation was. Okay? Jump down to verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. Let me know when you're there. Notice what verse 7 says. It gives you the details of what God was bragging about. Then the Lord God formed a man from dust, of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. You guys are there? Some of your translation says soul. Verse 7, one more time. Then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. One more time, one more time, one more time. Y'all haven't seen it yet. Then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Here's what Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says. The details of the creative process was a twofold process, not three. Let's walk it out. He took dust and he formed a body and he laid the body there, okay? And the body by itself, listen to this, it had all faculties, it had a mind, it had a heart, it had everything that the body needed. But listen to this, absent the breath of God, the body was useless. So for those that says that we are a trichotomy, meaning body, soul, and spirit, and then we explain the soul to be the faculty that we reason with, that we function with, that we do all this stuff, here's what I'm saying to you. In Genesis chapter 2 and 27, if that is true, how come it wasn't functioning in the body by itself? It was dead. It was not until God did the second thing, which was felt like Benny Hinn there for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> then when he placed, listen to this, the ruach of God or the breath of God, here's the term I want to use, the spirit or the soul into the thing. That's the only time the thing came alive. You guys are tracking with me. Come on, y'all. Does this make sense? Come on, say amen if it makes sense. If it's confusing, say it's confusing. Keep you, keep you. We'll talk about this Wednesday. He took dust. He created man. Then he took a portion of himself and he breathed it into the person or the, the, the creation that he made, and it was only until the breath entered the entity that the entity became alive. Very, very important concept for you to understand because remember when he created everything, he said his creation, he said it was good. So listen to me very, very carefully. Apart from the breath of God, mankind is dead. Okay, so here's the argument I'm, praying, I'm putting up front. It's not a body, then he took a soul and put the soul into the thing, and then he took a spirit, and then he put the spirit into the thing. It was a body in its totality, and then the only thing he added to it to make it alive was the spirit that existed by itself alive and functioning, and he put his living being into the body of man, and that's the only time the thing came alive. Two things. Very, very important concept. You guys are tracking with me. All right, pay attention. Very, very two important concept. So here's the thing. The two parts of humankind, listen to how I'm going to say this. They're fused together to create humanity. So here's what that means. If you ever reverse engineer what God did and you took the spirit out,
the body by itself cannot survive. You kind of get what I'm saying. But the spirit belongs to God. So if ever the spirit comes out, the body does what? So it seems to me that for me to be alive or for me to be considered human, I need a soul or spirit in me. And it seems to me that God is the originator of that. Oh, come on, say amen. Okay, so lock into the terms that I'm using. Humankind is created a unified person consisting of two parts, body and soul or spirit, living and acting together. So here's the reason I'm saying that. When God looks at you, don't make the mistake of saying, we've said this for many, many years, and we'll clean it up, we'll clean it up. So just go with me. Don't make the mistake of saying that all he sees is the spirit on the inside. No, 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 no. He had the spirit outside the body. Don't forget that. But when he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, his intent that whatever I create is going to look like me and it's going to represent me. So you cannot call yourself a human without the spirit of God in you. So when he looks at flesh, he expects to see himself. Oh my gosh. I, I know I'm messing you up. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, because y'all want to say mind, body, and spirit. I get it, I get it, I get it. Salt, I put that on the screen to remind me of this. Consists of sodium and what? Chloride. Yeah, y'all paid attention, right? Here, here's the thing. Salt is not considered salt if it's only chloride, right, or sodium by itself. If you take the chloride out, then the chloride by itself is pretty poisonous and pretty dangerous. But lock into this. Listen to the terms I'm going to use. When you fuse the two together, it makes this thing called salt. Then it becomes safe. It becomes healthy. So here's what I'm trying to communicate to you this morning. The only reason... I'm considered human is because of the fusing of flesh and spirit. Don't try to separate it. Because if you separate it, flesh. You guys all right? Y'all all right, right? And for many, many, many years, many, many years, the church has been trying to separate it because you haven't been taught well. So I want to show you identity and I want us to live well, okay? So you need your spirit to survive and your spirit defines who you really are. Oh, my gosh. You guys all right with me? Let me move. Let me move. Let me move quick because we're going to take, it's going to take us a little bit to flesh this out and to work through this. So listen to this. Whenever you look at scripture, this is just the surface level. We'll do this Wednesday. And you see the word soul and spirit. Those words are always used interchangeably in scripture. It is not there's a soul and there's a spirit. Okay, the words are always used interchangeably. The spirit can sin, the soul can spin. The spirit, you kind of, here's what it says. Um, don't fear him who can only kill the, the body, but fear him who can kill what? The soul, y'all know the scripture, all over the Bible it says that. So here's what it says, at death scripture says that either the soul or the spirit, meaning the same thing, the parts, it's not one or the other. It's not like the body goes to the ground, the soul goes somewhere, and the spirit goes somewhere. The soul and the spirit is the same. Y'all walk this out with me, okay? So here's what it is. I want you to hear me say this again. The body and the soul or spirit are fused or unified together, which makes me alive and the person that I am. That is oh so important. Oh so important. Oh so important. My actions, my being, everything about me is what you see is the totality or the fusing together of the soul and the spirit functioning together. So here's what's happening. This is the part that might mess you up. Here's what happens. Because a lot of us say, you know, my flesh is this. My flesh is that. My flesh is this. My flesh is all that good stuff. And I don't have time to go to Corinthians. We'll do this extensively on Wednesday. Here's why I'm saying to you the body is so important. Here's what happens when you die. Your soul or spirit 
goes to be with God, okay, or goes to this, this, what's the term I want to use? An intermediate state where it continues to live outside the body. Listen to this. Your body dies, your body decomposes, your body goes dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But listen to this. When Jesus comes back, he doesn't create a new body and then put the soul in it. Listen to scripture. He resurrects. You guys all right? So, so the new you, this is different. This is interesting. The person will assume, look at the last sentence, a body that has some points of continuity with the old. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If this life is reflective of the things of God, when God resurrects me, this body with the spirit in it goes to be with God. It continues while I left off. If this body was living after the enemy, when Christ resurrects me, this body, guess where it goes? You get it. I like that. The opposite direction, that's, that's user friendly. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't have time to go to Corinthians. I just want to make some statement. Read Corinthians chapter 15. The body that is sown in corruption will be raised. Now, granted, it will be a, a, an immortal body. It will be a body that won't die. But hear me say this to you very, very importantly. The body is important to God. You're made in the image of God. The body is important to God. We are made in the image of God. Does this make sense? Come on, I know it's, it's processing. Let me, okay, so here's some implications. Here's some implications. Just give you some applications and we'll pray and get out of your way. So here's the thing. Since we are unity, unitary beings, our spiritual condition cannot be dealt with independently of our physical or psychological condition or vice versa. Let me break that down. I can't say I'm going to fast spiritually to get close to God, but then take my body and go sin and do whatever I want to do. I can't separate the two, Deacon Brown. I can't do it. You guys are tracking with me, okay? I can't say the spirit man, spirit man, spirit man, spirit man, that the spirit man is, is going to be close to God, so I'm going to read, I'm going to study, I'm going to do all the stuff to build the spirit man, and don't expect the flesh person to be impacted. Nor, nor, nor can I do whatever I want to do with my flesh and don't think it's going to impact the spirit. They're fused together. So hear this. Whatever happens on the inside is going to impact what you see on the outside. And whatever happens on the outside is going to impact what's going on on the inside. The two are one. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So total depravity, and you've heard that term, it's a theological term, here's what it means, that sin infects all of what a human is, not merely the body or mind and emotions, but all of my body, soul or spirit, has been affected by sin. But listen to this, if I sin with my hand, my spirit person just sinned. Sin with my mind, my spirit person just sinned. If I sin in the heart, my spirit person just sinned. Is this making sense, guys? We're going to walk this out, okay? So it's affected, and so here's what I want you all to hear me say. God is at work redeeming people. Here's a statement a lot of you won't like. This is a lot of things you won't like, but this is important to me because this is going to stress the importance of one thing I want to make. As a unitary being now, so here's what it means. It's possible for me to be saved and still messed up. I can talk about me, and I can talk about you. <laughs> right? Do I have any witnesses in here? Come on, this one, the Baptist preacher said, do I have a witness? Come on, y'all. <laughs> Y'all ought to say, preach, you got a whole bunch, all right, with me? Because he, he, here's what that means. I love God, right? And it's not that you don't love God, but because our identity has not been clearly defined, we act right internally and act wrong externally because we don't see the two as one. 
Very, very important. Because here's what you say, and here's what I'll say too. Because we watch how a person behaved, we conclude they're not saved. Could it be that they legitimately have given their heart to God, but they have not taught, been taught, that the transformation on the inside ought to grow to a place to affect what's happening on the outside? But all we do is we judge the outside. So here's context. So God looks at the what? The heart, while we look at the what? External appearance. So God knows if the inside is right, but he knows the gr- This is important. This is important because let me tell you my story. I wasn't always preaching even after I came to God. Come on. I wasn't always praying even after I came to God. Come on. I wasn't always living right even after I came to God. And I think the same is true for you. But through a process of sanctification, God aligned my spirit man with my flesh man. And what you see is not who I was 10 years ago. I used to lie. I love God, but I can do whatever I want because I'm going to heaven. Stop the lie. God had to align me. Don't be so hard on the world. You don't know who you're talking to. Uh, Because a lot of us are sending a lot of good believers to hell, and we're going to be shocked when we get there. <laughs> Damn. Is this heaven? <laughs> That's changing me. That's changing me. That's changing me. Because here's where, this is the shallow Felix, right? This is how much I've grown this week. This is the uh, shallow Felix. Because they're doing that, they can't be saved. And then the Lord convicted me, who's discipling them to let them know not to do that because they are saved? Oh, that's because they are. Let me move. Let me move. So the gospel, listen to this. It's an appeal to the whole person. I need you to hear me say this. The gospel is not just an appeal to your spirit man. Listen to me carefully. Jesus did not go to Calvary only for your spirit. Because you're not going to go to heaven with your spirit only. When you go to heaven, you're going to have a bodily resurrection. You're going to have hands. You're going to have feet. You're going to have toes. You're going to have a brain. You're going to have that same thing he created that by itself did not exist absent the spirit because he said it was very good. So the reason he went to Calvary was for the totality of the thing that God said is very good, created in his image. The whole person, okay, and, and I like this, the significance of Jesus in his incarnation. Here's what Jesus came. Jesus came to the earth. Um, he had a spirit or soul, but he also had a flesh. And he demonstrated the unity of the two by living on the earth without sinning. And if he could do it, guess what he's saying to you and what he's saying to me? We can do it. But we don't understand that. And we want to see Jesus as God incarnated And we want to discount the clothes that he has on the outside, which was his flesh. He was tempted, yet he didn't sin. He was, come on, y'all, come on, does this make sense? He did that for a reason, to show the importance of that, okay? So redemption now is applicable for the entire person, not just the spirit apart from the body. So this is where I want to walk this out. Calvary is not about only your spirit man and not your flesh. The two are very, very important because the two makes one. So let me make a couple of statements, then we're going to wrap this up. So everyone has a soul or spirit in them. The problem is our soul or spirit is either dead to sin and alive to God, or it is dead to God and alive to sin. That's the problem. That's the problem. The only reason you're alive is because the breath of God is in you. Now listen to this carefully. What's the breath of God in you doing? Who is it connecting you to, the world or to God? So the difference between us and the unsaved people is the breath of God is dead to God 
And don't think it's completely dead because here's what we say. Their spirit is dead. No, it's not dead. It's not dead. It's alive to something. It's just not God. Remember that scripture for the, the absent from the body is present with the Lord? The same principle. If you're not alive to God, then you're dead to God. Right? Does this make sense? So uh, where, where my spirit, your spirit might be alive to God, for others, the spirit in them might be dead to God, but they still have a spirit. It's impossible to be alive without a spirit in you. The question is, whose spirit is it? Don't be so quick to say, well, it's the spirit of the devil. Don't be so quick. Because the devil did not take man and made dust out of him and then went like that. Because I've been looking at unsaved people all crazy. Jesus, why are you going to Calvary to die for people who have the spirit of the devil in them who told you it was the devil's spirit? You should see your faces. <laughs> I want to walk through this. Okay, I'm almost there. Very, very important. Okay, we don't have time to go to Romans. We'll do that Wednesday. Y'all, Wednesday ought to be packed. Let's do this Wednesday. So here's the thing. After, at salvation, our soul or spirit then is made alive to Christ. Now, hear this statement. Hear this statement. It is not so much that the existing soul or spirit is re- replaced with a different one, it then becomes an issue of surrender. That's a troubling statement. Here's what happens. When I got saved, I don't know, and I'm using subjunctive clauses here, I don't know that God did this. Hey, when I created, let me, give me that one back. I'm going to take that one back. And I got a different one. I'm going to put this different one in you. I don't know that that's what happens at salvation. Could it be at salvation? That where I was dead to him, I'm now alive to him, and the spirit that always belonged to him finally connects, and it becomes an issue of surrender. I belong to you. Where before I didn't know who I belonged to. Identity. I belong to you. And the whole time I'm dead, I fool myself into thinking I belong to the enemy. And so I do enemy things. So what happens at salvation, right? We're almost done. We're almost done. Let me give you this one thing. Very, very important statement, then I'll stop. So then here's the thing that I want to land on, and I want you all to hear this. Okay, last thing. Image bearers have the ability to exercise dominion over the current situation. Here's what you do. Simply surrender to God. And you accept his finished work of salvation on Calvary. You guys use the word do the work, I think is what you and Max said. This is the problem that messes us up. Because we want people to do something to make the spirit alive. In the law, Old Testament, obey this, offer this, do this. Do this kind of stuff, right? Watch the complexity of the New Testament. Jesus comes. I wish I had that cross up. He goes on the cross, hangs his head, and he died. Goes on the grave. He comes up from the grave three days later. Watch this. Body and spirit gets united as a unified being. And here's what he says. For your spirit to become alive, just believe in what I did. I ain't got to do nothing. Just believe in what I did. Salvation. It can't be that simple. No. Just believe. Preacher, where are you getting this from? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. That what? Whoever what? No, come on. It says whoever works. Whoever stops their sin. Whoever does. No. Just believe. Right? You kind of get what I'm saying? Here's what Romans says. Um, if you confess with your mouth that what? Jesus is Lord, and then do what? Believe in your heart 
that God has what? Raised him from the dead. What's going to happen? You shall be saved. Let me tell you what that means. That spirit that's in you, that's already there, God makes it alive to him. Then the song switches. I belong to you. The problem is we have to realize we're unitary beings and that the spirit now should dictate to the flesh, not the other way around. And we learn how to live this thing out. It's a different story. Kind of get what I'm saying? So here's my problem because I can't look at you and tell whether you believe or not. Can't. I don't think you can either. You can quote all the by the fruit you shall know. There might still be an apple, but they haven't produced apple yet. And where we have failed is not teaching people identity and who they are so they can start to act like Christ. Here's the opening statement. Let me see if I can go way back up to that. I want you all to get this real quick. Um, here's what it says, right? As an image bearer, God's design for me is that I become and I represent growth. Growth. Here's where I want to stop. I'm hoping that this makes sense to you. And we're going to spend some time fleshing out in the upcoming week. Two parts. And Calvary is all about redeeming the total person back to him. And for that redemption to begin, it's a simple statement. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. And if you've been struggling, if you didn't try to figure it out, and you have not said yes to God yet, man, today I want to begin the process of praying for you. Now, hear me say this. I'm not asking nobody to stop nothing. I'm just saying believe. If you belong to God, he's going to start changing. He's going to start the work. He's going to start the work. So bow your heads. Just bow your heads. Bow your heads. Come on, worship team. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. The trick of the enemy has been, look at how you behave. Look at what you do. Look at what you're watching. Look at what has you. And then saying, you can't be a child of God. Your identity cannot be in Christ because of these things. I came this morning to dispel the lie. And if you're here and you have not yet given your heart to God, I want to begin there to say, come on, give it to him. Surrender to him. Surrender to him. Surrender to him. Begin the process of giving it to him. Say, Lord, I want to be yours. I want to belong to you. I want to give my life to you. I want to say yes to you. And if you're here and the word has spoken to you and has convicted you, I want to give you a chance to come. I want to give you a chance to surrender to God. I want to give you a chance just to say yes to him. Jesus says it this way in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in and sup with him or her and him with me. If that's you this morning and God is speaking, come. You belong to God. Reconnect that spirit. Come on, reconnect the spirit. Reconnect the spirit. Amen. Reconnect the spirit. Don't stay sitting there. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. If God is talking, come. Come on, let's all stand to our feet. Come. Come this morning. And maybe you're sitting here saying, man, preacher, thank you for the message. Thank you for what God is sharing because that was me believing the lie, living a false identity. And thank you for being so affirming. If that's you, come this morning. Come. We want to pray. Maybe you're saying, I just need to rededicate my life. Come this morning. Know who God is. What you see externally is the totality of our being, body and spirit. If God is talking to you, come this morning. Come. Come. Is there another? Is there another? I just want to say, yes, God, I give my life to you. I give myself to you. Come